Welcome back to another episode of Broken Sylvia, where today we're going to be doing something a bit different compared to the normal working on the cars in the workshop. We're doing a mega Q&A. Uh, you guys have asked the questions, I will provide you with the answers. As I mentioned, I have nothing to hide, so some questions that you might not think will get answered will indeed get answered. Uh, pretty much as the channel continues to grow, there are more and more comments where a lot of the times these comments are commonly asked questions. So getting these questions out of the way with one video is a good reference for people. They can just go back, watch the video, instead of me having to dig through the comments and try to reply to everyone, even though I do try my best to reply to every single comment and Instagram message. So there have been a lot of questions submitted through YouTube comments and Instagram DMs. Uh, things like how old I am, where I'm from, how many cars I've had, the future plans of the channel, how the channel started, uh, what I'm going to do with the cars and stuff like that. So we're going to start off with me introducing myself. So question number one, what is your name? My name is Damien, I go by the nickname of Damo. Uh, my real name is Damian Bradonic, for those that can pronounce it. It is a Serbian name and surname. Next question. How old are you? I am 20 years old. I was born on the 8th of April, 1999. Where are you from? So, as you can tell by the accent and probably the number plates on the Sylvia uh, at the start of that build series, I am from Western Australia. Pretty much, I was born in Serbia, lived there till I was about six. Uh, moved to Australia with my, with my parents, my family and stuff like that. Uh, my brother and I learned English, but we forgot Serbian. So we returned back to Serbia for a few years. In the meantime, we went to primary school here. We have a bunch of friends and family in town. I'm from a town in Serbia called Nova Pazova. And dad opened up a spray painting business with his friend. His friend had the skills, dad had the funds. Uh, they got together and opened up a business that still runs nowadays. And it is on the bottom of the house. So the bottom floor of the house is a workshop where that business runs, while the top part of the house uh, is the living area where we are right now. Uh, pretty much, dad got used to the system of Australia. You go to work, you get paid and stuff like that. In Serbia, it just does not work that way. Uh, nobody, when, when you have a private business that's not serious, like it's not a huge company or something like that, people don't usually rock up on time. It's just the relaxed nature of working. Dad hated it and yeah, packed our bags and went back to Australia. Been there since 2011, but I do visit every single year, sometimes even twice a year. I come back to Serbia, visit friends and family and stuff like that. Next question, what do you study? This question is probably from Instagram as I might've posted an Instagram story of me at, um, at school. I'm halfway through my degree doing marketing and management at Curtin University. It's a uh, bachelor in commerce, bachelor of commerce degree, or whatever you call it. I'm not the biggest fan because I don't have the time to do what I'm truly passionate about, which is filming and working on cars, but I'm halfway through, so I might as well finish it. But I do have a solution to how we're going to find more time to work on the cars, which I'll be revealing a little bit later. What do you do for work? Um, I've already gone through this and I've made a few videos as well. I'm a part-time detailer. How do you afford these cars? So, I go to work, I work about 22, 23 hours a week. It's part-time work, it's a Monday and a Tuesday, uh, they're full days. And then a Saturday morning is just a little bit of work here and there, so yeah. I live with my parents, I have zero expenses, so anything I earn can be either spent on the cars or going out on the weekends. And I am forever broke because most of the money gets dumped straight into the cars. And when things like the Skyline pop up and I don't have the cash just laying around to purchase it, I actually knock on my grandma's door and see if she would lend me some money. Grandma is a huge supporter. And yeah, so little loans like that, I pinch off my grandma and then I pay her back when the paycheck comes in. That is the truth, I'm not making it up. It's going to sound insane to some of you guys, but yeah, as I mentioned, got nothing to hide, so that's how I fold my cars. How was the channel started? To understand how the channel was started, you have to understand kind of like the history of how I started with cars, but I'll give you a quick rundown. So pretty much the channel has been in the works, well, at least in my brain for the last three or four years. Now, <clears throat> I've seen what people are doing, what people aren't doing, uh, 
and stuff like that. What sort of content is out there, what exists, what doesn't exist and all that stuff. So pretty much I was like, you know what? I think that there is a little spot on this platform called YouTube in the automotive community for my, my style of content. And my first video was called Save the Sylvias. And that video is made up of two parts. The first part is my friend's S15 and the second part is my S14. Now that video was, uh, the first part, the S15 part was filmed and edited months prior to even planning on ever seeing the internet. While the second part I quickly put together and then slapped those two parts together and I had my first YouTube video. People kind of started commenting, messaging and stuff like that. I loved it and I've been super addicted ever since. And now we've got a little bit over 20 videos and we're just going to continue making these videos as time goes on. How did you get into cars? As usual, it's your parents to blame. So dad, uh, I was surrounded by cars and motorbikes at a young age, so I guess that's how I got into cars. Then in high school where the passion really came out was I found out about this YouTube channel called Mighty Car Mods and it's these two dudes working in a driveway modifying their own cars even though they're not professional mechanics. And I was like, what? That is insane. Like, I thought you had to be a professional to work on your own car. So that is really where the passion blew up and following that, you find out about other YouTube channels, people, normal people working on their own cars. So you're like, I want to do this and that's how I kind of got into cars. How many cars have you had? I'm pretty sure I've had nine cars, including the cars I have now and a few rolling shells. So my first car, I'll tell you a bit of a story on how I got that car. My first car was a BMW E30. So I was just about to turn 16, I was in class and I finished all the work I had to do on the computer and I was on Google searching BMW E30 in Google Images and a relief teacher walks up to me and I was like, oh man, I'm busted, you know? But turns out the guy was, uh, was keen to see what I was Googling and he's like, I have one of those cars. And I was like, what, you have a BMW E30? He was like, well, I don't know what it's called, but I have one of those cars. I was like, is it manual? He's like, yeah, it's manual. I was like, is it a two-door? He's like, it's definitely a two-door. I was like, does it have a sunroof? He's like, I'm not sure if it's got a sunroof. So the next day I saw him in class and he's like, yeah, it's got a sunroof as well. And I was like, would you maybe consider selling that car? He was like, well, you know what? I'm planning on buying my girlfriend's Volvo off her. So I think it'd be a good time to sell the car. And I was like, you know what? Let me talk to my friend. I think you'll be interested in it. So I go to Mickey and I was like, Mickey, there's this E30, my relief, relief teacher owns it. I think it'll be a good buy. Um, would you consider buying it? And he's like, well, offering 500 bucks. If he takes it, I'll buy it. I was like, no worries. So the next day I go back to school and I was like, do you want to take 500 bucks for this Beamer? And he's like, well, in the condition it's in, I think that's a relatively good, like a, like a good deal. I was like, yep, no worries. And in the meantime, I was talking to my neighbor, Chris. Now, Chris was going to rent out a workshop and I was talking to him about how I would love to have my own project car, but my parents don't let me have a project car because they see it as a total waste of money. Uh, and I told him about the idea of how this car popped up and he's like, you know what, that is perfect. Why don't we get that car? You can put the car in my name and instead of paying rent, you can clean the workshop. Neighbor of the year, right? I was like, done deal. So I go to the relief teacher, I was like, you know what? My friend won't buy the car. My neighbor wants to buy the car, neighbor. So I ended up getting the car, putting it in my neighbor's name. Uh, and yeah, that's how I got my first BMW E30, pulled the whole car apart and the floors were rusty, binned it. Unfortunately, if, if I knew what I knew now, uh, it probably could have been totally repairable, but that's how I got my first car. Then we'll, uh, my second car was a BMW E36 and a typical Eastern European thing to do is you buy your child a first car. So I was fortunate enough to have a free first car, which was a BMW E36. So then uh, after a year or so, when I, went, when I uh, went to sell it, I ended up with $5,300 in my hand, uh, which was a massive head start compared to many people out there. And with that money, I, I continued to buy and sell, buy and sell, made some profit until we finally got to the S14 Silvia. 
when I was 13 or 14 years old, between the age of 13 and 14, I think I had maybe like 14 or 15 um, motorbikes, pit bikes, dirt bikes, scooters, you name it, I probably had it. And yeah, I used to just buy and sell them. So that kind of grew into cars, buying and selling of cars before I got to that S14 Silvia. And this is where the story continues of how the channel was started. So that car I bought for a good price. Uh, and I was like, I don't want to put money in it. I want to enjoy it this summer. And once the summer is over, I'm going to sell that car. So the typical 17 year old thing to do is you crash that car into a tree. So I ended up with a car that was a really, really clean car sitting at my dad's yard for months, just cooking it uh, in the sun. I didn't know what to do with it. If I go to fix it, I'm going to lose money. If I go to part it out, I am going to lose money again. I just could not, uh, I just couldn't accept the thought of losing money on a car and even modifying a car because when you go to sell it, you're going to lose money. So fixing it was not an option and then parting it out wasn't an option either. And then probably about four months after the crash, a shell popped up for sale. And I was like, you know what? I could take the front guards, bonnet, and the radiator support out of it. My neighbor Pep could fix it for me and I could have a car back on the road. And that's what happened. My neighbor Pep fixed it. And instead of painting the front end, I ended up painting the whole car. One thing led into another. And before you know it, I was engine swapping it, filming YouTube videos and stuff like that. So you set one budget. The moment I went over that first budget, I just said, you know what? It doesn't even matter at this point. And the last two years, pretty much every single dollar I've earned has gone into the cars. So if you asked me a year ago, do I regret doing, uh, do I regret fixing the car? I would say yes, because I would never get that money back. But now with this whole YouTube thing, uh, I'm absolutely loving it. And I'm super, super happy for why I did that. That is why the channel is called Broken Sylvia because the Sylvia is forever broken and it was broken. Um, so yeah, that's how the channel started. If it wasn't for that car, I probably never would have put money into cars, never would have modified cars and never would have started filming videos. So that's how the channel was started. So this whole YouTube thing, uh, I make videos, hopefully people find them entertaining and they like watching them. Uh, the feedback seems to be quite positive, which I'm really, really happy with. And at the end of the day, if nobody watches the videos, at least I'm going to have something to watch when I'm 40 years old. So that's fine. Next question. How many cars do you have? I have two and a half cars currently, and I'll explain how I have two and a half cars. So pretty much I have a daily driver, which is a Holden Astra or an Opel Astra, if you're not from Australia. That car was my mum's old car. Now, mum bought a new car and I had a car. So my car was broken, mum had a new car and this Astra had to go up for sale. And I was like, you know what? Can I drive that Astra for two weeks until I fix my car? So obviously they're like, yep, no worries. You can drive that car for two weeks. Those two weeks were about three years ago. So yeah, I've been driving that car for the last three years. It's been my daily driver. It's been super reliable and I don't consider that car being mine, so that's not one of the two and a half cars. The next car is my S14 Silvia, which is, which is my car. My second car is the R34 Skyline, and my uh, half a car, the, uh, the two and a half in total, is a secret project car that Harry and I have purchased together, that we're going to rebuild together, and yeah. We're going to be revealing that, I would say, probably about September time, so keep an eye out for it. Next question, how did you learn how to work on cars? I'm pretty clueless about everything when it comes to cars. I just kind of try it and then it sort of works out. Luckily, I've had the Silvia to, to practice on. Uh, I think it was a perfect base, being a crashed car and stuff like that. It was just the perfect base to learn on. Now, everything I've learned on that car, I can, I can, take that knowledge and put it into the skyline and future projects. So pretty much how I learned how to work in cars was obviously started with dad, uh, continued into YouTube channels such as Mighty Car Mods and where 
Where I think it's the biggest thing is confidence. Now, watching Beers for Build, Chris from Beers for Build, just absolutely boosts your confidence. Like that guy went from rebuilding a blue BRZ to building a LS swapped uh, Lamborghini Huracan. So you're like, in the last three or four years, you can see how much he has progressed in terms of knowledge and everything. And he just sends it. And that's kind of the mentality I'm trying to have as well. Just try it. And if it doesn't work out, there's always somebody out there that can fix it instead of you. So yeah, give it a shot yourself first. What are your plans with the R34 once it's done? I can't give everything away, but I think the gearbox choice will probably be a big giveaway. The people that aren't watching the Q and A uh, will be like, why is he putting that gearbox in when that episode comes out one day? But yeah, the gearbox will be a dead giveaway of what I want to do with the car. Will you go all out modifying this beast? Yes, the car will be fully restored and I'll try to update as many components as I can because the car is uh, 20 years old at the end of the day. What engine and gearbox will you use? Uh, people got super rowdy in the comments. People are saying SRs. Uh, some guy even said like a Volvo engine swap, uh, 2J. Uh, it seems that Barra and RB were the most popular in the comment section. Personally, I would love an RB, but I would love an, a refreshed RB. So if the budget allows it, I would love to have like a built uh, RB25 or maybe even RB30. Uh, currently, I'm looking at the Spool Import Kit uh, Rebuild Kits. They're like a forged kit with a head gasket, comes with bearings, pistons, rods, all that stuff. So if anybody has any connections at Spool Imports, please let me know. Uh, I would love to work with them and I would love to learn how to build an engine. Every single build, I want to learn something new and do something new. So I think uh, an engine build is definitely on the list for the R34. All wheel drive or rear wheel drive? Rear wheel drive is honestly the only thing that put me off building a GTR replica. Because I was like, ah, oh, you need the all wheel drive, you need the high horsepower, you need this or you need that. And then I started thinking what I want to do with the car and I was like, you know what? Having an all wheel drive car is actually like a silly idea because the gearboxes are so, so expensive. And I was like, you know what? Real wheel drive will be perfect for what I want to do with the car. So real wheel drive it is. Plus, if I go to modify the chassis uh, to clear the drive shafts and I start cutting up the, the tunnel to fit the transfer case for an all wheel drive conversion, I think I might have some issues with the police uh, with the um, with the government, the inspection and stuff like that. So we're just keeping it real wheel drive and simple. Where are you from and how much do you pay for the R34? The first question of R answered. Uh, the second part of the question, how much I paid for the R34? So the shell was $1,000, the coilovers were $500, the boot with the fiberglass wing was $300 and registration was $200. So all up it was $2,000. Australian, which sounds insane. It was a once in a lifetime opportunity. Something like that will never pop up again. I think it was a reasonable price for the condition of the shell. It is a still, it's still a registered shell. That is the main reason I bought it. And I was going to cut up the rear quarter panels anyway. So it wasn't, it was a no brainer. I just went out, had a look at the car with my neighbor. He said, yep, yeah, this is totally repairable. The chassis are nice and straight. So yeah, that's how I ended up with the R34 chassis. Broken Sylvia also, what's the best way for me to start a YouTube channel? I rarely see any content about Mark III Supras, so I was debating on starting it, but I don't know how to jiggle with school since I'm still 17 and rebuilding my engine. I'm kind of in the same boat. I'm 20 and still in school, uni, same thing. Um, starting a YouTube channel, I say film what you want to watch. Don't film for the viewers because you won't enjoy the process. It is a lot of work, especially editing videos. For me to go out and film a video, um, takes longer because I have to set the tripod up, take different angles and stuff like that. But the editing part is, I can't say I hate it, but I'm not the biggest fan of editing because every video will take a minimum of 15 to 20 hours to edit up, find the music and stuff like that. So definitely film the sort of content you would like to watch instead of filming for, for the viewers because you will not enjoy the process. And the second part of the question, the Mark III Super thingy, um, I don't know what part of the world you're from. If you're in Australia, I would say skip the Mark III, go straight to a Mark IV because the Mark IVs are going up in value 
they're affordable in Australia and one day if you decide to get out of cars or you have to sell that car for some reason, it'll definitely sell a lot easier for a higher value as well. So I recommend go to a Mark IV Supra if you're in a country such as Australia. Hey dude, new sub. Was this car deemed a total loss? If not, do you plan on having it fully street legal? Yes. Uh, no. Yes to the second part of the question. The car will 100% be street legal. I want to drive this car in the street more than anything. So, <clears throat> but the first part of the question, was the car deemed a total loss? Total loss in America pretty much means, I'm pretty sure, is if you crash a car, you have a record that the car is crashed. This car was crashed, but in the papers, uh, when you do like a VIN check or something like that, there is no history saying that this car is crashed. In Australia, it says no repairable write-off record, which means, in other words, it is not, not deemed a total loss, which is a huge benefit because in Australia, we have uh, really, really strong regulations about what you can register and stuff like that. So passing engineering with an already registered car with no write-off record is a huge bonus for me. So that's another reason I bought the shell. If the car had a repairable write-off record, I probably would not have bought it uh, just because of how strict the regulations are. How long do you think this project will take you? Ideally, I would love to have the car done by June, July time, um, 2020. Uh, it's kind of like a realistic, unrealistic goal. It all comes down to funds. I think I'll have the time to uh, rebuild the car, but will I have the funds to finish it? I'm not sure. Uh, I'll definitely have the funds if I sell the Sylvia, which is something I don't really want to do. So if there are companies out there and sponsors that are willing to jump on board, support the build and gain exposure at the same time for, for themselves, that would be honestly the ideal way of building this car and the quickest way I could um, turn this car around from a bunky to a um, street car again. So yeah, I think one year is kind of like a realistic goal if the funds are there. How and where did you learn how to weld? More specifically, body panels, etc. Uh, we had automotive and metalwork class in high school and yeah, did a bit of welding there. I was horrible. Then I shaved the S14 engine bay. Uh, I used a MIG welder, just a cheap MIG welder with thin wire and gas. That changed the way I welded. So gas and thin wire for thin metal will change the game. Pep, my neighbor, was a professional panel beater. He also gave me a few pointers, tips and tricks here and there. So I guess that's how I learned how to weld. The welds aren't the prettiest, but they hold. So that's all that kind of matters. Next question is all to do with the music that I use in the videos. Now, I love sharing information and I don't want to seem like a dick, but hopefully you understand uh, from my point of view as well. The music comes from Epidemic Sound. It is a website that you pay a monthly subscription to and all the music is copyright free, which means you can monetize it, the music in your videos and stuff like that. So I used to list every single song name in the description, but I've gone through every single video and deleted it because um, as I mentioned, anybody can have access to that music if they pay a monthly subscription to. And a lot of the other YouTubers, you can notice songs between channels where the songs are identical from one another that have come from Epidemic Sound. I spend hours and hours on Epidemic Sound trying to find the right music that suit my videos. So if other channels grab that music and use it in their videos that aren't up to standard or aren't the way I would use it, um, that music will not have the same effect when you come and watch my videos, if that makes sense. So the music contributes to the experience. If others start using the music, it won't be as special. That's why I don't give the music away. And the dude that went on an absolute rampage and replied to every single comment on the latest R34 video, you're crazy. I don't know how you knew all those song names off by heart, but yeah, some dude went through 800 comments and replied to every single person asking about a specific song at a specific time. So yeah, please don't do that. I would highly appreciate it. And he also got blocked from the comment section. So yeah, sorry. What is the secret to restoration work like that? It must be the shorts. Nothing gets more in the way of getting, work, think, getting things done than hot carbs. It is definitely the short shorts. I'm always in shorts and always burning myself with that welder, but that's okay. 
How did you get a brand new quarter panel wood? This is literally, I've gone through it in videos, I've gone through it on Instagram. All the body panels can still be purchased through Nissan. Now, I bought all my body panels through Total Nissan. Abdul hooked it up, he hooked it up with a mad discount, and yeah, that's where I got my body panels from in Western Australia. There are dudes from Germany and the US that are messaging me that are currently doing the, and France as well, that are doing the conversion. These panels you can purchase through your local Nissan dealer, and trust me, uh, they'll probably give you the best price through the dealership than other sources, uh, because other places will not only charge more, but will also add shipping on top. Or Nissan can maybe even give you a bit of a discount if you let them know what you're doing and stuff like that. Um, so yeah, go straight through Nissan. Uh, my first quarter panel was actually damaged. So I called up Abdul and I was like, look man, this quarter panel is kind of bent. He's like, yep, no worries. That same week, I got a brand new quarter panel. So, so yeah, definitely go through your local Nissan dealership. And if you're in America and you can't get Nissan Skyline parts, go through Canada because I know that for sure you can get Nissan parts, Skyline parts through Canada, which leads to my next point. What made you start the R34 rebuild, the GTR conversion and all that? Now this, this is probably people are looking at like, by the time the car is done, you could have just bought a real GTR. Now, let me explain. To save up for an R34 GTR, you have to have a minimum of 80,000 Australian dollars and good luck finding one for $80,000 nowadays. So to save up $80,000 working a normal job, normal I mean low income job, especially being a student is, is like, I don't want to say it's impossible, but you have to be so dedicated to put money away and you're going to miss out on so many things uh, because you want a car in the garage. Now if that's your dream, that's fair enough, I respect that. If you have a, like a higher paying job, you have your own business or something like that, uh, those $80,000 might not be as big and it is worth the investment because it is worth the investment because these cars are going up in price and stuff like that. Now the reason why I'm doing things the way I'm doing them. Firstly is because I can have that car right now. I can film YouTube videos, I can tell a story, I can have a car that I've built when I was 20, 21 years old and I can keep forever and that satisfies me. And this kind of goes into the budget of the car. The budget for the car from start to finish is about $40,000. Now for 40 grand, you can have a fully refurbished and rebuilt R34 GTR lookalike that will never be a GDR, that will never have resale value, but that's fine because this is a forever car. Or you could go out and try save 80 grand and you're going to have to put another 20, 25 grand in it regardless, even more if, you, um, if you're paying someone to do the work. I can guarantee you that a 20 year old Skyline will definitely need a respray. It'll still need that single turbo conversion. It'll still need wheels. If you want the Z-Tune kit, you're gonna need the Z-Tune kit. So before you know it, you're already 25 grand deep. So you're over $100,000, which in my opinion, working a low income to, to normal job is totally stupid because you're missing out on many other things you could be doing. Personally, I would rather be, I would be more satisfied with a $40,000 car that I have built myself and then I can use then I can, any other money I make, I can use on things like traveling or maybe save up and buy my dad his dream bike and that way we can both be happy, have our dream toys instead of me going out, saving up a hundred grand for something that's going to sit in my garage and miss out on so many other things I could be doing because I, I was just putting money aside for a real GTR. If VIN numbers and badges and resale value and stuff like that bother you, Fair enough, go for it, buy a GTR. Personally, that does not bother me, so I will be happy enough with the GTT. As I mentioned, this is all working a low income, normal sort of job, because I know once I'm finished with uni, I might not even want to be rebuilding cars. So while I'm at uni, I'm still playing around with cars, I'm having fun, but yeah, and that's why I'm doing things the way I'm doing, doing them. Oh, and going back to my point, uh, the whole Canada thing, uh, about two years ago, I was on YouTube, as you do, and I was looking at R34 videos, and I came across this video of this guy rebuilding an R34 Skyline. And I was like, 
I was looking at the rear quarter panels and I was like, that's not a GDR, that's a GT. And it turns out that it's actually a GT4, which I didn't even know existed. So pretty much the underbody of the car is identical to a GTR. It's got the bigger, the bigger um, uh, gearbox tunnel. It's got the notched chassis, the same subframes and stuff like that. And this guy was doing the conversion with metal rear quarter panels. And I was like, what? This is what I want. I've always wanted metal rear quarter panels instead of fiberglass rear quarter panels. And if you know me personally, I've wanted a GTT to GDR conversion probably for the last five years. I even photoshopped a car, that car in front of our house in Serbia, how insane I am about it. So yeah, and it turns out that the guy in Canada is a young Serbian bloke um, doing the conversion. So as you do, jumped on Instagram, uh, slid into his DMs and I was like, hey man, like I really wanna do this. And he pretty much gave me every single thing that I needed to do, gave me all the, the a parts list that I needed to get. And that's kind of where a lot of the motivation started to, I want to do this myself because I saw somebody else do it. And now there are guys messaging me on Instagram, doing their conversions such as Germany, US, France, and stuff like that, which I'm super, super stoked for them because not everybody can afford an R34 GTR. Future plans for the channel, why don't you upload more often? <clears throat> Why I don't upload more often is because I have to go to work to pay for the cars. I also go to school, so working on the cars, even though I want to make it a priority, I just physically can't do it because I have other commitments, if you may say. Now, I can't give up on work because I need the money to work in the cars, so the first thing that I'm going to have to give up on or slow down is school. And I'm going to, instead of go, do full-time study and finish my degree in one and a half years, I'm going to switch to part-time study and complete the degree in two and a half years. That way, it's going to be a lot more relaxed. I'm going to have more time to do the things I love, such as filming videos and working on cars. So once I'm back from my trip um, from Serbia, definitely, definitely expect more videos, uh, more better quality content, more videos, more regular videos and stuff like that. And also another thing I would like to add is we didn't have a workshop. Once the S14 was done and I brought it home, I didn't really have a workshop to work in. And I can now happily say that we have sorted out a workshop so there are now zero excuses why I can't work in the cars. Take the badge off. Um, when, they, when this comment is in regards to the R34 GTR badge on a GTT car and yeah, I'm kind of like not a fan of GDR badges on cars that aren't GTRs, but it came with the boot I bought, so it's going to stay on the car until one of you talented graphic designers or artists comes up with a name or a badge for the car. So what I want is, I want a badge about that size uh, that is located in that spot. Now the build series is called Poor Man's GTR, so what I was thinking, if you can maybe incorporate Poor Man's GTR into like one badge and something we can 3D print and paint and put on the car, or like a totally different name, for the car, come up with an idea. If there's something I like, I'll definitely get it 3D printed, painted, and we'll stick it on the back of the car, so. Yeah. Why did you just stick fiberglass rear quarter panels on? I'm pretty sure the question was supposed to be, why didn't you just stick fiberglass rear quarter panels on? And now, let me explain this. I bought the car as a wreck, so the right-hand side, the quarter panel was, was torn open, so it had to be replaced anyways. Now, I'm trying to use as many original parts, OEM Nissan, as possible. And rear quarter panels are a big one when it comes to the look of the car. No matter how good of a body man you are and stuff like that, it is just physically impossible for you to, it's not impossible, but I've never seen fiberglass rear quarter panels, even though if they've been molded in, look as good as the metal rear quarter panels. I've got an eye for detail, as you can probably tell, I'm super, super picky and fiberglass rear quarter panels were just not acceptable for this job. And as I mentioned, Nissan also provided a quite a discount, so I, could, I couldn't say no to metal rear quarter panels, even though, even if I had to full, pay full price, I would have bought the rear quarter panels. So, I'm trying to build my dream car for a fraction of the cost. Now, building my dream car is not fiberglass rear quarter panel, it is metal rear quarter panel. So, I'm not trying to skip corners, I'm just trying to do things, uh, if, if, if I don't need it, I won't have it, but metal rear quarter panels are a must. So, fiberglass, painting the ass to work with, 
Rear quarter panels will never look the same as the metal ones and stuff like that. The front end though will have to most likely be fiberglass because the original z tune front end costs an arm and a leg which I can't afford and we're going to have to do an aftermarket. Fiberglass front end. Gallo 12 or Gallo 24? I think Gallo 30. What is happening with the S14? The S14 we don't talk about anymore. Nah, I'm only kidding. Um, the S14 has been put aside. It is it is at home, it's in the garage, just chilling. It needs another few bits and bobs such as the fuel system on the side from the fuel t filter to the fuel rail, the drive shaft. It needs an ECU, that is the biggest one. Now, I could have either finished the S14 or started the R34, I had that choice. Now, if I went down the route, I finished the S14, I get into dramas such as police, uh, mechanical failures and stuff like that. Anything that happens to that car, it's not game over, but currently how much income I have, it pretty much is game over. So in Australia, we have these things called defect notices or yellow stickers. If a cop thinks your car is fully illegal, which this thing seems like it is, he will put a yellow sticker in your car, which means me, uh, I would have to take the S14 over inspection. The car has to be pretty much bog, like stock standard or engineered to pass uh, inspection. My car has is probably too low for inspection. I would need to get different wheels for it. I would need to plumb the screamer pipe back in. I would need to get it engineered because it has a different engine in it. It's just drama after drama after drama. So instead what I decided to do is I decided to begin the R34 project and do the bodywork because the bodywork pretty much doesn't cost us any money. It's just my time. So we'll try to get that car painted as soon as possible. And the moment that car is ready for an engine and gearbox, the R34, then we're going to jump back onto the S14 and finish that car off and get it running, driving and stuff like that. And I can also produce a lot more content out of the R34 uh, rebuild videos instead of the S14 driving. So with the money I had, I decided to dump it into the R34, create more content, make awesome progress on it, instead of just having a car that's driving. I haven't had a nice car to drive in probably about two or so years now, so I can probably hold out just a little bit longer. Do a price reveal on the Silvia. Yep, I'll definitely make a video on how much uh, the car will end up costing once it's finally complete, but so far we are $39,000 deep, including the car. So as I mentioned, I had a head start. My parents bought me my first car, that was $5,300. Then I pretty much got given a set of Workmeisters by Scott, that was another three grand. So let's say about nine grand is not my money. The other 30 was earned by myself. So do I think it's a waste of money? As I mentioned a year ago, I would say it's a total waste of money. But now with this whole YouTube thing taking off, uh, I don't mind. I don't mind that things went the way they did because this was an awesome platform to learn how to work on cars, how to build cars, what you should pay somebody else to do, what you should do yourself because sometimes doing it yourself is not worth the hassle, your time, and so, so yeah. It's been an awesome learning platform, the Sylvia. It is an enormous amount of money, but what's there is there. You can't really take it back. So yeah, that's how much money has been spent on the S14 so far. Also, I see a lot of Spanish and Russian comments. I don't speak Spanish, I don't speak Russian, and these comments are huge, they're like essay paragraphs. So if anybody has an answer to, to the question and can speak either Spanish or Russian, please reply um, in my name because I can't speak either of the languages. Are you going to get into drifting? Yes, I would love to learn how to drift, improve my driving skill and stuff like that, but at the moment, it's just not possible because I'll need to get a trailer, I would need to build a drift car. The S14 is just way too clean to be drifting at. Uh, you go through tires, you're going to start breaking cars, parts and stuff like that. And where I would end up is, I would end up with a lot of driving skill, but I would end up with a hunk of junk sitting in the garage. And that's just how it is, you end up with a drift pig. So instead, I would rather build a few nice street cars and one day if, um, if I'm fortunate enough to have the budget that allows for a bit of drifting as well, I would love to get into drifting um, too, but for now, just nice little street cars that I can I can drive on the road. Dream drift car. 
I think my dream drift car would be an E30 M3 replica. I would probably use fiberglass rear quarter panels on that one because you would rip them up every time you blow a set of tires. But with the 2JZ, that thing will look so cool and it would be pretty unbreakable. The 2Js are awesome engines, so I think that's what my dream drift car would be. Future project cars. There are way too many ideas in my mind that I genuinely can't sleep at night even though, even if I'm tired. Uh, I want to build a Supra, an S15, an R32 GDR, an E30 M3 replica with the metal rear quarter panels as a street car. I want to do so many things but it all comes down to budget really, time and money. So if we can get sponsors on board helping out with builds and stuff like that as the channel progresses and as it grows then things like that would be totally possible. Otherwise, working a normal or low income job, totally impossible to have so many cars in a short amount of time. So yeah, merch. Merch in terms of shirts and stuff like that. Uh, the channel has grown so, so quickly that I don't think we've made a uh, connection between viewers and me just yet. So if I go out and order a bunch of merch, firstly, I don't think it will sell very well and I'm, I'm pretty busy with the things I'm doing right now, so having merch and having to send it out and order it and I think it would be too much work and I don't think it's the right time to do it now, but in the future I'm sure there will be merchandise um, for sale and stuff like that. Again, all proceeds from that merchandise would go directly into the builds, which means more regular videos and again, we can play with more cars and stuff like that. But what I was planning is I was planning on making about 10-15 shirts for friends and a few of the loyal subscribers and if you may call them Isaac you're definitely one of them uh, just people that comment on every single YouTube video showing support or or giving feedback about how things are what I should do uh, because at the end of the day I can't see everything I, I work in the cars then I film the cars then I have to review the footage I have to edit the footage and I have to watch the video once it's put together so me welding one hole, I watch it 15 times, you watch it once. So I, I can't judge the footage myself, so having people uh, re review the footage and give me honest feedback about it is what I love the most. And yeah, as I mentioned, Isaac is definitely one of the dudes that I'll be sending a shirt out to and stuff like that. And who is your biggest motivation, like life motivation, oh my god. I could talk about this dude for hours, but it is Yun Olsen. The dude is an absolute legend. If I could follow a few of his footsteps, that would be awesome. Just a dude traveling the world, loving life. Um, now he's calmed down since he's got a baby on the way and stuff like that. But, but yeah, that guy is just something else. And that concludes the Q&A. I hope I've answered a few commonly asked questions. If there are any other questions that might have not popped up at the time or now you have an idea, and you would like answered, just comment it below and I could probably even bring it up in the, in the next video just quickly. But yeah, hope you guys have enjoyed this different video. I hope it hasn't been too long either. And if you want live updates, just follow the Instagram page at Broken Sylvia. Uh, once I come back from my trip end of August, mid August, it's pretty much we're going to almost start like a season two of, of Broken Sylvia where as I mentioned, more regular content. We'll be making awesome progress in the car. Hopefully Harry, my friend, will be around a little bit more so we'll have more hands on the cars as well. And we'll be doing the project reveal. So comment below what you think it is. For the people that have stuck around this far, we actually bought a Supra. No, that was only a joke. You should still comment below what you think we have purchased as the next project car. Thank you for watching and I'll see you guys soon.